Okay, welcome back. Um, we go go ahead with the class. We've been uh, we we started off with the next skill, which is uh, responding skills. We looked at uh, how we can respond. What are the different uh, ways, uh, types of responding, um, uh, and and we looked at a few examples as well. Um, let's let's look into the next one. Okay, so how is there a certain process in responding? Now now this may look extremely. Um, you know, it may look very mechanical, but this is, you know, because it's it's also part of an academic learning is why it may be needed for us to to understand, especially when we're new into counseling or new into using some of these skills. Uh, we're kind of thinking of, okay, is there a process in it? And, and uh, although it looks very academic, very bookish, uh, this is just to help you to improve on these skills. So when you're looking at the process, it involves four steps. The first one is taking in cues. Now, taking in cues is now when you are communicating or uh, when the other person is communicating, you are listening for and you're recording some cues in, in certain areas. And in these three areas, you're looking for cues in their content. That is the words actually that is being stated in the content of the information and maybe even the meaning of those words. So sometimes you may need to uh, clarify what uh, some words that they're using actually means. You are the, another cue that you're looking for is feeling. So what are the feelings that are stated or something that is implied? It is not um, uh, overtly uh, stated, but it is being implied. So that's the cue that you take. And the third is the content. That is the the uh, material or the data or the information you know or are aware of um, that that which is related to that which is being communicated um, but but they may not be actually communicating to you so sometimes they may be giving you a certain vague um, uh, information and uh, that's something that that you are attempting to reflect and to respond to OK, so or any other information that is there in the past. So you take cues on the content. You take cues on the feeling. Sorry, the sorry. Yeah, you take um, um, views on the content. That is what the meaning is, the feeling, as well as the context, the context of the uh, entire um, uh, entire uh, 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 communication that's happening. The second thing that you're doing is you're going to sort out. What are you doing? You're sifting through these cues that you have found, and you're coming to some kind of a judgment about uh, about what the essence has been of a particular uh, a few lines or a particular sense of communication that they're going through. So you're sorting out, taking off all details that are unnecessarily, only keeping that which is needed for you to reflect back. The third is you're drawing a conclusion. Here, you're determining what the essence of that of that entire communication was. You're formulating a certain a conclusion or an inference uh, for yourselves about what you're thinking. And you're reflecting it back so that the speaker understands or your client, your counselee attends, um, uh, begins to see that you have understood what, what they have said. So you're formulating an inference, you're thinking about a sentence, and you are bringing it about of the way that you think that the counselee was trying to say. And the last is expressing it, expressing that essence. So you're stating the essence of that communication to your counselee in your own words in order to check out whether you have understood what the person has said. So you can reflect um, your behavior as well as your words. So even your facial expressions can actually express your magnan magnanimity of what you've understood. So uh, you're, what you're doing is you're, you're it is especially important when you when you know someone is feeling something but maybe isn't saying anything. So that sometimes is also being reflected in your words. It's be, it's also being reflected in the way that you respond to that certain situation. So this is what you would look at if you're looking at a certain guide or a certain process. That's what we're going to be looking at. Now, in our responses, we've got to be careful that we do not, uh, we do not give what we call as uh, we, we say as a high risk response. Now, a high risk response, 
um, is when you're listening um, to something, okay? It's in listening. It's, it's a statement which can likely take the focus of the other person and generate certain negative feelings. So what you what happens over here, it's an interfering response, okay? And it can be inappropriate uh, because uh, maybe the counselee has a very strong need to continue in that state of mind or in that place where they need to communicate. And you as a counsellor have begun to um, turn it around or, or switch something which keeps them off that focus. Okay. Now, a key element, like we, like we were looking at in responding, a key element of listening is to keep the focus on your counselee's thoughts and feelings. And what, what does a high-risk response do? It's not an effective listening skill or a listening, listening reflection. And they, they, sometimes we use that high-risk response when we think we're listening. But the communication process becomes very frustrated and it and it gets blocked, especially when we use certain high risk responses. Now, these responses are experienced by your counselee as an interfering response and is and it can be like it's written here. It can be inappropriate when especially when the person has a very strong need to stay there, maybe in the problem or in the strong, strong feeling. High responses can fall into these three categories. The first one is evaluating and judging. So what is evaluating and judging? It is changing the focus of the conversation by shifting it from your counselee's concerns to your own interpretation, judgment, or um, diagnosis, or even praise of the other person, right? Or when you are agreeing, or even when you're disagreeing with them, it kind of becomes like an evaluating or judging. Okay, the the subtle message that is sent when you're evaluating is there's something uh, there's something wrong or, or or nothing is wrong, right? So when you're actually doing that, when you're when you're doing an evaluation, now remember evaluation and judging always we kind of think of it is in is in the negative, but it can also be. Uh, it can come across as very positive where the counselee kind of feels that nothing's wrong, right? When you when you make a judgment about certain of their behaviors or how they are feeling, you're helping them see there's nothing wrong, right? Uh, what you want to do is to have a very neutral stand and not shift it to your own judgment about something, right? So the high risk responses that's that's what it's when you evaluate or when you judge and say okay um if they if they have, if they're talking about like for example we saw it in that video about that boy getting getting caught um in school right um immediately when we when we go, when we go back to what is it that you think about your own behavior right so when you're getting in it you, we've already come to a place of judgment even before he has actually processed a lot of other information that's there. So that's the first high risk re response. The second one is solving. Solving, what we're doing is we are sidetracking your clients, your counselees' communication by moving right away to a solution that is being offered to them. So either your questions, your advice, or uh, maybe moralizing or problems solving for them interferes with the the counselees uh, exploring of their thoughts and feelings that can actually lead them to their own solutions you know which addresses to the heart of their situation so when when we do that when we are attempting to do that we've actually lost out a lot of um, good that can come as a result of counseling so using a response in this category, what does it communicate? It communicates that, you know, hey, you're really stupid or you're really dumb to figure this out on your own. And let me tell you how it can be done. Now, that's what it sounds like when someone is solving somebody's problems. Now, all these responses, um, except threatening and moralizing, 
are appropriate when your counsel when your counselee has finished struggling with the issue and needs help or when your counselee has finished what he or she wanted to say actually coming up to that point of you know like like in this boy's case actually coming up to the point of say okay what do you think of your own behavior is a good question nevertheless it's come at the wrong time we've we've actually moved 10 leaps and bounds beyond what he needs to try and figure out for himself and we've we've gone past that stage into something else so it is a good response but we uh, it becomes inappropriate at that time however threatening or moralizing is is a high risk response it becomes as if you're solving or again placing a judgment on them the third one is withdrawing withdrawing is distracting the other person or the your counselee from the from their agenda it's by uh, reassuring that you know everything will be all right or diverting them to another agenda this message conveys that you know what it conveys to your counselee is that hey i am quite uh, uncomfortable dealing with this issue. So when you tend to withdraw, when you tend to distract them into something else, it makes them, it, it, uh, what, what you're actually attempting to do is that, you know, or not, you may not be attempting to do that, but how it comes across is that you personally are uncomfortable with it. But you're, you're, you're allowing them, when you stay within it, when you give them this responses, you're staying in with them at that difficult moment. Even though you may not know how to proceed further or how to get them in, you're still uh, just being there in that situation. Like if you if you remember in that um, uh, in the video that we saw, she's talking about her mom. She doesn't come to a place yet to tell him or ask him how how the relationship with his mom can become better. She doesn't go there at that point of time. She waits for it. Uh, and allows him to feel that uncomfortable feeling, allows him to feel the uncomfortable feeling with his father before she could move on. So, so that's that's what we look at as high risk responses. When they're responding, being careful not to bring about an evaluation, a judgment, a resolving, or a diversion or a withdrawing from the needed situation that's there. So that's where we are at. Um, high risk responses okay uh, any any questions up until now before we get into the next section of this of, of how do we respond to to counselees who may be very very challenging any questions okay yes yes Divya. go ahead yeah, thank you, ma'am. In the last point that you said, right, withdrawing. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, did you mean like if we try to even like console them or comfort them, uh, even that is kind of a high risk response? So comforting, counseling, uh, sorry, comforting or uh, you said consoling, right? OK, so give me an example as to what you would mean. Uh, if the, uh, for example, the counselor is talking about a very difficult uh, marriage, uh, so so in in uh, she might not have finished saying all all that she is going through, but mm. meanwhile, if we are trying to you know comfort and say that uh, it's going to be all right, is it uh, like is it something that can shut her off? I yes. didn't get it actually. Yes, it is something oh. that can shut them off. Because oh. uh, what we are attempting to do there is, uh, OK, so for example, think of it the way. Now, you're talking to me about, let's say, something with maybe a member of your family. You have a child, right, Divya? Yeah, two okay. kids. So, OK, so you're telling me something about Let's say they have failed. OK, so the first thing you're saying, Jean, my kids have failed in class, and I'm, I'm, I'm really worried about them. OK, that's your statement. Maybe the first thing that I say, it's OK. I mean, it's all right. They will be all right. Uh, you know, things will be OK. Um, uh, this has happened with my kids, but they are OK right now. Um, you know, how's your work going? What would you feel? Yeah, like not completely. Um... 
paying attention or maybe just shifting to another topic so very fast yeah, yeah. so it it also reflects to you that maybe i'm uncomfortable to to be with you in your point of distress mm -hmm. yeah so yeah, yeah maybe consoling and comforting has a place like for example and, and i see this very often especially in grief right um, you don't know what to say when someone is in grief uh, someone has passed away and um, it's very uncomfortable because you just don't know how to handle it uh, and someone said okay you, you know um, somebody somebody has passed away and you may say oh i'm sorry but you know at least now they're in a better place right it's not that it isn't true it is true and you are called to comfort and uh, console but maybe that's a very premature statement to do then right but rather how would you respond is oh is it so i'm so sorry this is extremely shocking this must be such a loss for you and what are you doing you are joining with them you're empathizing with them in that grief right and and that's why a lot of us, especially christians need to learn how to respond in grief because we tend we give such high risk responses we withdraw away from the matter it becomes so inappropriate especially when there are such strong feelings that you've really not helped the person grieve or you have not grieved alongside with them right so any kind of consoling comforting has its place it has its place but not up until a time that it seems that they are ready to be comforted and consoled but you uh, continue to respond in a way that you show them that you are with them in their stage of grief right to like when they're crying said okay stop crying i mean uh, you know this isn't that that again is what we're doing is withdrawing from them and getting them to to think or to emote another way that sounds appropriate to you so all of those are the timing of those can make it a high risk response but in a point of time maybe over a period of time or when they are ready to move into the next stage comforting consoling giving hope all of that is suitable but there is a time there is a pace in which you do and and it may be different for different people but to really get it from them is about like for someone someone may say said uh, you know i am uh, i understand this i i know that i should uh, i know that things will be well i definitely know that things will be well and maybe that's their cue to tell you hey i don't want to stick on there i'm ready to move on maybe that's the clue that they give you and so you join in along with them to respond uh, similarly. Yeah, yeah is got, that got, got that? Got, yeah, got it, okay. got it. Okay. Yeah. So okay. it is just that it has uh, it has a place, but it's not like jumping too fast uh, before they could express completely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Be because the emotional component in any issue is the place we need to um, uh, tap into because they need to come in tune with that emotional space before they come to a, to a phase of solution finding and often as uh, uh, as counselors or as just people who relate we are very quick to want to fix the problem of somebody but the you know the uh, you're a good relator when you're able to stick by with the emotion and thought process of the person and then you know when they are ready move them into the next phase and that's that's very important for a counselor to to take care of okay okay thank you thank you ma'am okay. it's so it's so sometimes it becomes so uh, you know tempting to you know find a solution but yeah absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely yeah yeah okay good okay so we're going to be looking at another smaller section because um, there may be times that that you may come across people who are not who are showing resistance to 
not just counseling, but maybe even a communication with you. OK, so who are these challenging counselees? So there are there are different kinds of challenging uh, counselees who may come to you, those who are unresponsive and just silent, OK, uh, who will who will not don't want to talk, who doesn't want to have anything to do with uh, discussing things with you, those who are superficially agreeable, that is, on the face of it, they have come, but deep within, they've actually made up their minds that they really don't want to do anything. Those who do not come in on their own volition, that is, on their own, uh, on their own desire, those who are threatened by someone to come for counseling, or those who have biases about counseling. Okay, so I think we the assumption that we need to make is that people who come for counseling, counseling, generally they expect that you will criticize them and you will focus on their weakness. And that's why a lot of people show uh, uh, a fear of coming because they feel that you will be judged, you will be criticized, and it's more about focusing on what their what their issues and their weaknesses are more than knowing that you know they will be challenged and they will be helped to think uh, think wider okay let me um, let me play this video for you and uh, then we could get into further uh, the the topic Deborah, when we spoke on the phone um, during the week, you were explaining to me that um, that your boss had asked you to come in today and have a, yeah. a chat about mm. some of the stuff that's been going on at work recently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, she is just such an idiot. Um, I'm really annoyed about this whole situation. Deborah, when we spoke on the phone um, during the week, you were explaining to me that um, that your boss had asked you to come in today and have a, yeah. a chat about mm. some of the stuff that's been going on at work recently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, she is just such an idiot. Um, I'm really annoyed about this whole situation. Right. This is just a waste of my time as far as I'm concerned. Right. You certainly sound annoyed even right at the mm -hmm. start here of our yeah. session. What's the reason that she's asked you to come in? Oh, God. She had a whole bunch of these like little trainee nurse people running to her and complaining about how I manage them. And it's it's outrageous. You know, they come in, they're hardly trained. I don't know what they do at universities anymore with these people. But you know, this one, this, a shockingly bad attempt, which she called giving an injection. It was just ridiculous. And then, you know, like the minute you sort of like say to them, this is a problem, be professional, pull your act together. Off they trot with their little tails between their legs, going, you know, whinging about my behaviour. And now I'm sitting here with you. Right. I mean, no offence. I'm sure you're great at what you do, but like, I could be out there doing my job. Right. It, I mean, the impression I'm getting from you is that you don't. It's not something that you really see the need to do to come in here, but it's something that you've been kind of God, all forced this into talking doing. Talking about your feeling stuff. I mean, no, it's not my scene. Right. So what was, I mean, I take your point that you, know, that you seem to see that some of these other nurses that are working with you haven't done their job well, and, and the way you describe it there, it sounds as though you're just doing your best attempt to kind of improve their skills, yeah. improve their training. Yeah. I mean, if I was to ask your boss, what, I mean, what was the issue that she took with the way that you were handling this? She said that I was being too aggressive and that I was, can you believe it, like, messing with their self-esteem as though it's my job to look after their little self-esteem problems right. you know either they do the job or they don't okay and so i was just being very clear saying that was just a ridiculous thing you did this is how you should do it get it right you know it was just being clear okay and that's what she meant when she was saying aggressive i presume so mm. i mean it's just like you know when i did my training and went through all of this stuff you just did as you were told and you got things right. You didn't run around worrying about how you felt about it. Right. And so it sounds from the, just the way that you're talking that you don't see the way that you manage this as being aggressive. You wouldn't use the same sort of word. No, no. Mm -hmm. It's just getting to the point. Okay. No nonsense. Right. I suppose being fairly firm with them from what you're saying. Yep. 
Mm -hmm. They certainly know where they stand with me, absolutely. Right. I'm curious th that, that your boss seems to have singled you out for this sort of thing, and it's not something that they seem to have needed to address with other staff in the workplace. Though. And what's your explanation for that? Why is it that you've been the one that's been asked to come and see me rather than anyone else in the oh. workplace? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's just... I've just been unlucky with the trainees I've had. Um, it's one... It's the most obvious reason I can think about, you know. And they've now got all this anxiety since there's been problems in the, the, the health force about, you know, any kind of inappropriate behaviour. So I think that they've just become trying to pander to the community and the community's needs and, you know, nurses are precious and we can't train enough of them. And I just think they've all just got totally over the top with all these worries about things. Right. It does sound as though there's some difference of opinion between yourself and your boss. And I it, hope so. And it also sounds as though it's probably sa fair to say, though, that you are coming into conflict with some of these people in the workplace. Well, what if they just knew their place and just mm. understood that it's my role to tell them what to do and they do it? Mm. I mean, if they got that, there wouldn't be a problem. Right. And, and maybe that's the case, but I suppose it, it seems at the moment that they're not getting that. And no, they're not. No. You're right. Hmm. I mean, in fact, they should be sitting here, not me. Hmm. Okay. Now, because you are the one sitting here, I suppose, one of the things that we need to consider is you know, it's difficult for us to control their behaviour, but you know, there, there is a bit of an opportunity here, I suppose, for us to consider whether there might be some changes that you might be willing to make in your behaviour. Are you saying that, that you think I've got a problem in my behaviour? From what I've told you, do you really think I'm the one with the problem? Well... I suppose it's difficult for me, not having been in the workplace, to, to make a, an informed judgement about that. This is typical of you people. Like, it's just fence-sitting, isn't it? Right. Well, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that I have to be very careful of is to not make a judgement about something where I wasn't there. And, but I suppose to help you maybe come up with some ideas as to whether you might be able to make some changes yourself. I don't need to make any changes. Right. I'm fine. They are the problem. Like, I mean, you know... Can't you see that? Well, I mean, I, I certainly see that that's the way that you see the situation at the moment, that you see it as you know, something where it's the other staff that are the problem yeah. rather than something that you're doing in your behaviour. Yeah, mm. yeah, good point. Right. So we don't? Well, I suppose what I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is that even if there is, there is problems with the other staff, that their behaviour is a little bit beyond what we can do here. And But that, as I said before, there is a bit of a chance that... Yeah, maybe this might be an opportunity for you to consider whether there are some ways that you might want to change your behaviour, or at least consider that. You may be right, but then you, again... You really are starting to imply that this is my fault, aren't you? Is that where you're going with this? No, no, that's certainly not what I'm trying to say. What, well, what exactly are you saying then? Well, I'm, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that in any conflict in the workplace, you know, there's two agents in that conflict, and that one of them's outside our the control. Two to tango story, isn't it? I suppose that a conflict exists between two people and that we have to recognise that the one person in that conflict that you have some control over is yourself and that, as I said, this may be a time that you can consider making some changes. Oh look, I am just absolutely sick of this nonsense and I think you are just basically pandering to their stuff and I don't want to keep on doing this nonsense. I mean, honestly, what's your problem? I can see that you, you're getting quite angry. I'm furious. In this what do you mean, quite yeah. angry? I'm furious with this. Right. And and I suppose when when you are so angry like this, it it does make it difficult for us to talk about this in a kind of reasonable, calm kind of manner. I'm, I'm wondering whether it might be useful for us to take a break for a couple of minutes, and then come back in and start talking about what we might be able to do, given that you have come along here today what we might be able to do to help, I suppose, resolve some of this conflict in the workplace. What do you mean, take a break? Well, can we just maybe stop for two or three minutes? If you'd like to go outside, grab a glass of water, and we can get you a glass of water, and then come back in here in two or three minutes, once both of our kind of arousal levels have calmed down a little bit, and we'll try and approach this again with a bit of a fresh perspective. Mm, OK.
Okay. Um, yeah. So, what did you all notice? What did you notice? He's the... extremely upset, and <laughs> he doesn't want to be corrected, and the, and he, with so much patience, uh, the counselor is trying to get into the situation. Mm. So, so much mm. to see in this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, yes, Divya. I think there are two of you raised your hands, but Divya, yeah, I can see only your hand up. Yeah, Divya. Yeah, I, I felt like uh, the counselor was uh, coming to a judgment too soon um, okay. and also not addressing the issue the person is facing, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, not addressing in the sense, not trying to understand uh, her feelings completely, mm -hmm. uh, but going into the problem mm -hmm. and trying to fix it in uh, if uh, assuming it is the first session mm -hmm. uh, so i felt like it's jumping into the conclusion too fast but it was good that uh, they took a break like in mm -hmm. between yeah yeah so this this is again a, a simulated one just for us to probably just see what it is um, so yeah you you are right that maybe this is not exactly how how it goes but they kind of did a quick uh, review of it okay Yes, uh, Collins. Colin Lubega. Yes. I am saying. I think this lady is not fit to be a team member, more or less a team leader. <laughs> I really don't know. In my culture, we have a funny saying uh -huh. that dogs don't climb trees. And if you find one up there, it means somebody put it there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so you will, in fact, you know, this this kind of a uh, um, picture that you see is is pretty common in a counselor's room, because a lot of times, especially when they are sent by someone, here she was sent by her boss, or you know, you have students who are sent by their uh, principals. This is something that you will very, very commonly see where uh, uh, counselees are challenging. There is a huge sense of resistance that's there. So it, it takes uh, one, a lot of time and a lot of patience to work with uh, counselees like this. Nevertheless, I think uh, uh, you know, keeping away the, the factor of time in this entire, uh, in that series that you saw, what would you like to notice about the counselor and the way that they he approached the entire? So what was he trying to do is he was trying to help her personalize the problem, right? So was trying to say, uh, what do you think you could do about, about what you've seen or what control would you have in, in your behavior? Because we see that we don't have control over your training trainees. The only control that we have um, is with you. What is it that we could look at? So that, that's what he was attempted to bring, to personalize the problem to her, right? So what, what did you notice as some of the key uh, things that he did? Uh, you know, if, even if you look at the way that he responded, there were some things that he did to actually help her see that he was with her through that entire, uh, through the initial process. Only when he brought about this point of, you know, how could we look at your behavior? Or, or you know, your part of the the story. That's when you know she became extremely uh, uh, offensive there, right? Okay. So, what did you notice about uh, about the counselor here? He was doing a lot of uh, exploring into mm -hmm. the situation, uh, like what exactly has happened. Even though she was sent by her. Uh, boss, uh, he's mm -hmm. trying to understand yeah. the real situation that she is facing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I feel like he tried a lot of exploring into her uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. So yeah, so I think that's that's what he was he he did attempt. Like you know, you wanted to be firm. Like she was saying, I, I don't think it was aggressive. I think it was just being firm. Uh, all of that. So you know, he he did a good job of 
of getting up there. But then, th then she got extremely aggressive over there. So there, um, there are there are I guess there are many ways that we could deal with that. Uh, at, at the point of time that they begin to see that uh, uh, you know maybe a counselor like for me, um, if I if I if I would see a person like this, I would slowly you know back down, right? Uh, because the more that you're being confrontational, the more challenging they are going to become for you. So I would back down and maybe just work through some of those things that she's she's feeling, right? Maybe one key question, even as when I was looking at it, I was thinking, what would I have done differently to help the person? So I would have asked maybe, um, you know, I would have asked a question like this. I said, OK, um, you know, with all the conflict that's happened over here, uh, what would you want to do? Or how would you like to respond in a way that would bring about a positive interaction from your um, from those trainees or from your boss. So I'm not I'm, I may not really focus on the behavior at that point of time because you know I think that kind of triggered her, but I would use a statement like this, what would you like instead if you were to bring a positive, if you could have had the ability or you know if, if you wanted to bring about a positive response in your trainees, how differently, uh, would you have behaved or how differently would you have responded to them? So that will get probably get to think, yeah, maybe I should, uh, you know, so so I've, I've kind of helped her to foresee, or, I, or this is what I'm thinking, I'm trying to get her to foresee a situation uh, that she may not have experienced up until now uh, because of what, what there is. But I'm saying, okay, if you had would have had a positive response from your trainees, what would that look like? How would you... Uh, how, how would you have behaved uh, uh, differently, right? So, so I suppose I, I'm, I'm supposing that you know that could have kind of worked for her to maybe think in the direction of trying to resolve her problem without really making a judgment on the fact that she's she's wrong or or, or you know where, where she's at. But nevertheless, you know, like I said, these these are people you're going to have. Um, uh, these are kind of issues and situations that you will have. All right. So, okay. So, how do we respond to challenging uh, counselees? Uh, what are some of the lessons that we can actually pick up, and what what do we really need to uh, need to do? So, when we are confronted with a challenging counselee, we must first focus on their self awareness. How aware are they? Okay. So, in counselling what we emphasize is self-awareness is the first step for working effectively with them. And in some ways, those counselees who behave defensively are, uh, you know, are, are, are a very diverse kind of a population. So as a consequence, the first step for a counselor is to look at ourselves and see how we might be contributing to an environment that is viewed as threatening or may not be entirely conducive to uh, to them okay so what we are go attempting to do is we are going to align ourselves as an ally they shouldn't see us as the extension of the problem right so we we, are, we need to be careful that we don't do that sometimes we may also need to stand along with the power of the client or, or the counselee, right? Um, sometimes it will help them to turn their defenses down. It will it will kind of bring down the fact of uh, uh, of where they they are at. Now, remember these are these are only suggestions. Maybe it doesn't work with all of them. Maybe this client that you saw here was a really difficult one. Nevertheless, these are some things that we keep in mind. What we try to do also is to put them at ease and let them know that um, you know, we don't instantly expect. Like, for example, those who may not want to talk, counselees who don't want to talk, you're not, uh, you, you want to let them know that you don't expect them to, to be able to share everything. Like, for example, let's say a teenager or a, or a, or a spouse who is unwilling to be in a session. So something that one, one of the things that I generally do is you, you know, kind of concede with them, say, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's really difficult to be in a place here when you know you really don't want to. Um, I, I'm sure even I wouldn't like to come to talk to someone when I haven't given them my um, 
my consent, right? So I can I can see that it's really hard for you. So what you're doing is you've one you've put them at ease, and you've also aligned yourself with them that uh, you're telling them, hey, it's 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 fine, it's fine that you don't want to talk talk about it. Something else that I would probably do is uh, I'd ask them, um, you know, rather than really putting the focus on them, I would put the focus on on maybe let's say the parents or the other spouse and ask them, you know, what do you think your father or your mother or your spouse is expecting to see here as a result of you coming to see me? What are they hoping for? What, what do you think they're hoping for? And so you've taken away the spotlight from them and you've actually put it on on the person who's brought them there, they may be a little bit more comfortable to talk about it. So there, there are very many different ways that you can actually respond. And, and honestly, it's something that that comes up only as you keep doing more of it. You know, uh, initially I've made so many mistakes because I don't know what to say. And often I've said, hey, if you don't want to be here, maybe it's a good thing. Uh, be, we don't sit and talk, right? But then I've lost them. I've lost them forever. But there are ways that you can actually respond and help them to feel that this entire interaction with you has been a pleasant one. Maybe they haven't spoken about a lot, but their interaction uh, has been a hopeful one. Like, for example, or another question that, that I would generally ask is, what would tell you that you're comfortable here talking to me? What signs or evidences would tell you that you're comfortable talking to me? Right. So they may say, um, if I'm at least able to, you know, not feel this angry right now, like how I'm feeling, I think I would be okay. So, you know, so what you're doing is you're giving them a preferred future, a preferred place to look at, even as uh, you're, you're working alongside with them. Okay. So when you're responding to uh, to these kind of uh, uh, counselees who are very resistant or very challenging, something that you you can do is to um, uh, uh, more than looking into the problem, focus on their strengths, focus on things that they do well. Right. Uh, so w one of the ways that you could do that is. Uh, uh, um, you know, I, I, I kind of see that, you know, your parents have had a certain idea of bringing you here. But, you know, um, maybe for our first conversation, I'd like to probably really not focus on that. How about we talk about something that you really like? What are What is something that you really enjoy doing? Or what is something that you find yourself extremely strong in? I'd really like to know that. So what are you doing is you're fo you moved away from the problem focus into something that is maybe the strength of the individual because they begin to feel that you know you're not there sitting to to really uh, dig out something right and be uh, engage with them actively as as you keep listening to them and uh, what you're also going to emphasize there is that they actually are the real experts of their lives and not you Right, and you're sitting here as a facilitator. So, so for example, I'd say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad. I'm, I'm sure there are many things about you that I don't really know about, and I'd be keen to understand how you work through some of that. Look, so they may say, hey, I'm, I'm good at football. I'm good at uh, uh, X, Y, Z. So I said, you know, uh, great. I mean, uh, uh, what, how, how do you manage to, to get so good at that? So, what you're doing is you're, you're kind of putting yourself on a step down and saying, you know, I'm looking at you. Uh, to show you that you have good resources, you have that ability. So you've given them a good sense about who they are because they probably come there feeling very judged, feeling as if, um, you know, there's going to be another person who's going to beat them, beat them and, uh, you know, give them a hard time. But here, what you're actually attempting to do is helping them uh, see where, where they are at. And when counselees act that way, don't take it personally, right? It's not against you. It's only their plan, it's their defense because they need to take care of what they are feeling. So they're actually taking things out like that because in order to uh, help them cope with it. Okay. So what are the skills that are needed in, in such a case is um, a few of this is necessary where you're able to express empathy. Okay. Where uh, as, as a counts, as a count, see the counseling may be just, just pretty, pretty. Uh, tired or pretty just frustrated with the entire process. So you are there to show them uh, uh, empathy. Okay, You're also going to avoid argumentation. 
you're not going to say, uh, you know, no, but uh, there is a problem with you. Uh, that's why your parents have brought you here. You know, you should just uh, don't don't get into uh, combat with them. You know, attempting that they will probably think about it. it. It's not the time to get angry or not the time to confront that way. So avoid any kind of argumentation. Then sometimes a role with the resistance, right? Like for example, let's say um, you know a counselee. Um, says, yeah, my, maybe when they have a drinking problem, yeah, my mother thinks that I have a problem, you know, but she's wrong. I do not want to stop drinking. As I said, I do not have a drinking problem. I want to drink when I feel like it, you know, just like this counselor. So, um, so the counselor may say, you know, you roll with that reason. So others may think you have a problem, but, but you don't, right? Yeah, so that's right. My mother thinks that I have a problem, but she's wrong. So you're just rolling with that resistance like 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 this man did he was exactly doing the counselor was doing that he was rolling with the resistance yeah you know you don't see it as aggressive when they see it as aggressive you don't see it as aggressive. so what do you see it as he said maybe i see it as firm so he's agreed okay that's how you see it right next is you you recognize their strengths as i said you know uh you, you're, you're you're basically trying to help to see how they can uh, what are some of the strengths that they have um, so that you can help them to look into a different different form of the of the entire problem. So, what are some of the strategies that you may need to employ as you're doing this? Is one you talk about the idea of counseling and any fear associated to it. So you can agree that your counselee has reasons for being upset or angry and that they're valid, while also <coughs> excuse me, while also you are commending uh, the fact that they are willing to participate okay so you you bring down any of those fears and you commend that idea you also uh, concede power to the client you give them the power that uh, yeah wherever they are for some point of time you need to give them the power you can acknowledge that it can be very awkward right uh, like maybe for those who are very quiet or um, are, are very closed in that it's a, it's a very awkward way of uh, of what's happening you can disclose what you have heard or read about the person like for example maybe um, you know you have a sheet or or someone's actually um given you a reference so you can say you know this is what i've understood but nevertheless you know this is secondary to me it's really important for me to hear from you uh, so that you know i can understand where you're at so what you're doing is you're saying whatever someone else has said is secondary it's not as important as what i want to hear from you or you what you can do is you share how your counseling approach uses no pressure so you're saying that you know uh, that you would like uh, their honesty and their uh, uh, their uh, approach to it uh, uh, willingly rather than having um, uh, rather than their resistance so you, you what what you're basically saying is you know helping them to see that uh, you want them uh, to, to join in alongside with you okay so that's that's how some of the strategies are okay so what are some uh, what are some things that you will you will you need to look at when you're looking at a resistance so here there are two types of resistance is one what the counselee is struggling with inside and there's something called as a counselor's error so in this the counselor is trying to get the counselee to do what she's not ready to do okay or what they may be afraid to do or maybe does not understand or does not even want to do so in this case, the counselor's <coughs> excuse me, uh, impatience can create resistance. And it is, and sometimes it can be the counselor's greatest enemy. So the counselor is trying to proceed in a manner that may not be suited to the client. And that's something that you may have seen in the in the uh, example that we saw okay so maybe maybe the counselor has used a language in a certain way that does not uh, help the counselee to move forward um, uh, but what we need to see is we approach it differently okay and like i said these approaches need to be learned there are very many ways that we we approach this so some ways that you can see that resistance is being expressed is by the by the counselee is through these ways one is they're unwilling to change okay which we saw here there can be blaming that uh, your counselee is blaming other people for their problem there can be excuses 
The council is making excuses for their behavior, which they're saying, I drink not, not because I want to drink, I drink because my wife bothers me. Or they are minimizing that they suggest that the uh, you know that you as a counselor is exaggerating all the dangers or you know or, or even their parents or whoever whoever's bought them they're exaggerating the risks or the dangers and it isn't really so bad okay there could be a pessimism where the counselee makes statements about himself or others that are very pessimistic okay nothing will ever change this is how it's going to be you know whatever you are approaching is a positive way they will say oh no but 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 they'll keep going on with that but 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 means they are okay to stay in that place of disease or that place of discomfort okay or disagree here the counselee disagrees with any suggestion and de definitely does not offer any kind of a constructive alternate. alternate. So this includes that, um, you know, they, they say yes, but, you know, it always explains what is wrong with suggestions that are made. Then this is how you see that that a person can, can, can get into a, a place of resistance. So as, uh, how do we respond to that? First is to reflect. The simplest approach to responding to resistance is with non-resistance. That is just by repeating the counselee statement in a neutral form. You just keep responding in, a, in, in the same way, um, just so that you know, you're, you're able to stick on with the time. The immediate, immediate time you, you resist, it is going to bring about a, 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 a sense of withdrawal. So here, a counselor says, I don't plan to talk to my mother-in-law ever again. So the counselor says, OK, you're hurt so deeply that you don't think you can talk to her at all, right? It's just reflecting that. You don't say, oh, you know, that's not right, or you know, how would that turn out for, for you and your mother-in-law and your husband? Don't go there. When you begin to see that resistance, just stick on with the, with the, with the person, OK? Next is to be able to point out discrepancy. Here is to acknowledge that the that the counselee um, uh, that that the counselee uh, uh, whatever they have said, but also stating contrary things that they may have said in the past. Okay, so that's why you're pointing out a discrepancy. I think I have an example here. Yeah. Okay. Here's the example. So the counselee says, "I know you want me to give up smoking completely, but I'm not going to do that." Okay. So the counselor brings up a discrepancy and says, OK, you can see that there are some real problems here, but you are not willing to think about quitting altogether. So they may have said, you know, whatever there are, uh, the issues have been there in the past. They're saying, OK, there are problems, but you're not willing about willing to, uh, to, to quit it altogether. So what you're doing is you're helping them see that even in their manner of communication, there seems to be some sense of a discrepancy that's there so that's how you tend you you get to a point of confronting the discrepancy or or helping them see that there is a discrepancy in the way that they are thinking all right the third one is to reframe what does it mean to reframe is you're offering a new and positive interpretation of a negative in information that is provided so that's what that's what my question had earlier if if you if uh, you remember i i said uh, if your trainees needed to view this interaction positively, what would it look like to you? How would you differently respond? So what am I doing? I'm offering a new and positive interpretation of something that's been negative. So it, it offers a new meaning about it. OK, I think there's an example here. Yeah, the example here is. Uh, my mom is always nagging me about my study. It really gets to me, right? So uh, so what the counselor says is, it sounds like your mom really cares about you and is concerned, although she expresses it in a way that makes you angry. Maybe we can help her learn how to express her concern in a more positive and acceptable way. So here, you're not looking at this, but you're looking at something else. Or you know, a, a different way of saying this is, uh, you know, uh, it sounds like your mom is really concerned about you. How would it look like, uh, how would you like her to see this instead? You know, what kind of a place or a state of mind would you want her to see it, see her instead? So she say, yeah, instead of her nagging me, I want her to support me, 
right? So then I've got that, the positive frame of it and say, okay, what would supporting uh, you look like? So she may say a few things. Okay, what would you like to do to help your mom see that you want her to support you? So in that way, I've actually got it back to the counselee to get to discuss with her mom about how she likes, likes to be supported. Okay, uh, and the last one is to support self-efficacy. So what what does what does this this entail? This um, many many counselees may not have a well developed sense of self-efficacy, and they may find it difficult to believe that they can maintain or even be, begin a certain behavioral change. So when you want to improve self-efficacy, self-efficacy is the uh, way that they are doing something. It may require that we are eliciting and supporting hope, uh, supporting optimism, and also looking at how we can accomplish change. So this may require us to recognize the strength of an individual. And that's why that's important, you know, to dealing with the strengths of people and bring that into the forefront whenever possible. So you're not looking at them as a problem, but you're looking at them as a way of working with their strength. So unless a counselee believes change is possible, this discrepancy between the change and feelings of hope, hopelessness is likely to result in a denial. And that's why self-efficacy becomes a very important part of behavioral change. And it is crucial that us as counselees, counselors believe in their capacity and in their strengths to be able to reach their goals. OK, I know I have really sped through but because it's a it's of a lack of time but quickly any any questions um uh any questions here anything that you all want to bring up so we we looked at at uh, resistance and how we can deal with some of those resistance any questions <clears throat> i just uh, had one question ma'am yes uh, so you talk, talked about different kinds of uh, discrepancies. So how does one recognize like, uh, if uh, the person is dealing with uh, what kind of an issue? Like whether it is uh, like something like uh, uh, they believe that they won't be able to do anything about this or how does how do you recognize it? Like uh, I, I believe there were some categories that you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. earlier yeah but mm -hmm. uh especially with the last one that you just said the self-efficacy part so how do you recognize for example if it is self-efficacy um uh -huh. how do you analyze or recognize that they lack that or uh, they don't believe that they are able to make a change so they will they will articulate it to you you know so one is they may say something like when you have a resistance they may say okay i know that i have these 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 many issues with this problem like we were talking about that smoking right so he, she knows he knows that there are many um uh, fallouts of smoking that uh, he or she has seen in in their life and then they're saying uh, you know, I don't want to quit at all. So there, there is a discrepancy. Then they say, so you, that's also resistance. You're seeing a discrepancy there. So maybe a question like, you know, you you did articulate to me that there are these issues that you're facing, but nevertheless, you find that you know uh, your willingness or or your ability to change is something that you feel you're not able to get. So I do see a discrepancy there. How can I help you in understanding this better? So that's the way maybe that you need to bring about a discrepancy. They will tell you that. Or when you're seeing strengths, that's what I meant by there may be times needed that you're not only talking about the problem, but you're also finding out what all they have a potential for. Like they may say, you know, 10 years ago, I was able to do this, 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 and this. So five things they were able to do. And now they're saying, I'm feeling so hopeless. I don't feel like doing anything. So what are you doing? You are bringing them back to their strengths and saying, that you know there are there was a point of time that you did that i'm interested to know how did you do that what what were some of the details of how you did it so you're picking up from a strength that must have been five ten years back and trying to bring it into their current situation in order to help them to move away from that resistance give them that hope and that optimism saying you know this is something you did this is something you were able to manage this is something you formulated yourself what is it that we can look back and take so so generally 
discrepancy will come out in your conversation. You will be able to notice it. And that's why uh, what you have picked up in earlier sessions become very useful for you, maybe at a time they're very resistant. So it, it it's something that will come up. Uh, and something that you may need to build in, especially with clients who are or counselors who are resistant or challenging, it is to build about their strength and use their strength in order to deal with their current denial or pessimism or hopelessness. It's it's to do that. Yeah, Divya. Yeah. yeah thank okay. you. Thank you. Mike. Okay. All right. Um, I'm sorry I took another 10 minutes of our class. Thank you for your patience. Uh, can somebody just close with a word of prayer? Jeffina, would you like to close with a word of prayer, please? Yes, ma'am. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for every single thing that we that we learned today, Lord. God, we, you created all these beautiful people around us. And God, you created us to be a light to them. Every single thing that we learn, Jesus, in this counseling session. God, I pray that we will put it into practice, just like how you moved with compassion. You looked at them. Help us to move with that compassion and love so that we can reflect you on this life, Jesus, through our words, through our actions, and through everything that we do. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Please uh, don't forget to do your assessment before the 14th of March. Thank you. Have a blessed week. Bye-bye.